Dobar večer, sem Nada Pretnar, zgibanja za pravice palestincev in za tiste, ki prvič ste se pridružili nam, naj samo povem v dveh besedah, da mi smo neformalna skupina, ki deluje v solidarnosti z palestinskim narodom in za kar koli želite, vam bi povabila, da pogledate našo spletno stran, ki je palestina.si. Najprej se bi rada seveda zahvalila vodnikovi domači, ki skupaj z nami nekako nas časti v svojih prostorih in tudi absolutno Kristina Božič, ki vodi to serijo srečan, ki se je začela pred dobrim mesom in povčene dvemi s prvim srečanjem v sklopu ciklusa, ki smo ga imenovali Palestina v besedah in nekako ta ciklus srečan je namenjen temu, da približamo slovensko javnost recimo z palestinskim glasom, o katerem se zelo malo sliši, preko literature posebno. Danes kot tretjo srečanje je z nami Gada Karmi, ki je pisateljica, ampak je tudi zdravnica, je akademik in aktivistka za pravice palestincev in naj še dodam, da je rojena v Jeruzalemu. In to zakaj povem, zaradi tega prav, ker mislim, da čeprav se nismo nič dogovorili, ampak se mi je zdaj avtomatično, skoraj, da bo Kristina se povezala danes tudi, glede na dogodke, ki se dogajajo te dni, te dni, že te tedne bi rekla, v vzhodnem Jeruzalemu in posledično tudi pred tremi dnevi se je začela v Gazi in torej tudi v tem mislim, da bo govora. Jaz ne bom predstavila Gade Karmi, ker to pač je naloga naše Kristine, Jaz se samo še enkrat zahvalim in predam tebi besedo, Kristina. Najlepša hvala. Nada, hvala. Pozdravi v Trst. Hvala. Pozdravi tudi vsem. Hvala vodnikovi domači za to, da smo lahko tukaj danes gibanju za pravice palestincev in predvsem Gadi Karmi. Jaz bom zdaj tudi predstavila se v angliški jezik. Gada, it's a huge honor to have you. Uh, here tonight with us uh, from London. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. I should say hello to you, and it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's, it's a great honor for us to have you and to host you. Um, we are also very happy that in Slovenian we have a translation of your work, of your memoir, The Return. Uh, it was published by the publishing house Sofia uh, two years ago. Um, but perhaps I'll try an introduction, which given what you have done in your life for sure is not going to do you justice, but I will try. Um, so you were born in Jer Jerusalem and when you were nine years old, your family uh, had to flee uh, from Jerusalem, from encroaching violence of Israeli militias and um, groups that were involved in the ethnic cleansing that somehow preceded and accompanied the establishment of Israel. Uh, from there, you first fled to Syria and then you found a new home in London where you have studied and worked, you studied medicine, you worked also in NHS, so National Health Service. And in 1971, I think something that is worth mentioning, you assembled a field hospital, if I understand correctly, and moved it to Lebanon, to the refugee camps there. Um, and in 1972, you also set up the first British Palestinian medical charity, Palestinian Medical Aid, and later an organization, Palestine Action. Um, so Gada Harmi has also worked for Palestinian Authority um, in Ramallah, in the offices for communication and media, which she also, um, very, with great detail and also great emotion, uh, 
describes in the translated book that we have and an experience that somehow brought about also great disappointment. Um, her great memoir, In Search of Fatima, um, is, if I use the words of Edward Said, with whom you have also worked, um, a story of exile and displacement. But I would say that it's also a human, a story of human experience, something that also um, Dr. Said mentioned. And given the situation that we are in today, given the fact that on Saturday, we're going to be commemorating the 73rd anniversary of Nagba, and that we see the violence happening in Jerusalem, um, ethnic cleansing that continues in Sheikh Jarrah, also in Israel pr proper, uh, we've seen the protests in Alit, um, or Lod, as it is called. Um, what kind of memories does this bring uh, for you, looking at the situation, um, looking at the violence that is happening, and the protests that are continuing, somehow the perseverance of the Palestinian fight that your life is also somehow um, also a proof of? Um, look, I, I have to say that uh, it might be that people might uh, would expect that I will say that I <clears throat> it, it evokes memories of um, how my family was evicted from Jerusalem um, and that it makes me um, very sad and so on. But it would not be true. In reality, I'll tell you what I feel. I feel a sense of uplift. I really do, because you know, uh, the Israelis um, have behaved so badly that they have been able to do something which the Palestinians were finding very difficult to do, which is to unite, to unite. You know, I mean, as you know, that because of Israel, we are fragmented, we are divided. There are people like me. There are people who are living in, well, as I was living in Ramallah under occupation. There are people with Israeli citizenship in 1948 Israel. There are refugees living in refugee camps. All of us are separated and leading different lives. But this action of Israel, this aggression has managed to make all these different Palestinian communities come together and you express themselves together and demonstrate together. And that is very uplifting. Uh, don't get me wrong. It's not that I think uh, it's very nice. Of course not. There are people dying. There are, there's a lot of damage being done. It's very tragic. But you can't help feeling over and above that that the Palestinian people, much as Israel has tried, and God knows they've tried so many times to destroy these people, the, the, the people will not be destroyed. They're still around. They're still aware of history, of their rights. And I don't want to make it sound like a rally, but uh, it's expressed to you that I don't actually have a sense of sadness. I have a sense of worry, obviously anxiety about the damage that's being done and the, and the people who are dying. But I also have a feeling of exhilaration. We are not dead. We haven't gone away. We're still here and we're still fighting. After 73 years, right? Of it's occupation. And, and and not only that, 73 years of persistent, unceasing attempts on the part of Israel to get rid of us. It's done everything it can think of. I mean, think of it. It besieged Gaza. It's separated off from the West Bank. The West Bank has checkpoints all over it. People can't move properly. Their lives are miserable. Um the, the 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 people in Israel, the ones with the Israeli citizenship, are discriminated against. Uh, there are people in camps. You know, you can't think of many more ways that Israel 
can do to get rid of us. But it doesn't work. It hasn't worked after 73 years. Now, you have um, written in your books also about the one state, something that also Edward Said um, advocated. And you have dedicated your book, Married to Another uh, Man, to this idea. And so this is an idea for you that's probably at least 20 or even more years old. And now it seems again, it's gaining traction. Um, we, it seems like we've come a circle or how do you understand this somehow change? Um, because what I've been actually shocked um, uh, well, regarding my own ignorance, um, was the fact that the word apartheid has been used a lot in the 70s, in the 80s. And yet now we're you know, somehow happy that um, also Israeli organizations for human rights or international organizations and politicians all over the world are adopting this term. Uh, do you see in this some kind of, you know, moving forward? Um, what do you feel needs to be understood in the present situation and about the one-state uh, solution? Yeah. You see, um, Israel has been able to do what it does because it hides under a disguise, a disguise that it is a... Mm, uh, a liberal state, um, rather like on the Western model, um, that it has liberal values um, and that it is a normal state like any other. You know, this is what has allowed Israel to continue to do and to commit the terrible crimes it has done against the Palestinian people. Now, the issue of these new reports about the apartheid system in Israel um, are lifting the disguise. They, and that's why they're very important because they're lifting the disguise and people are beginning to understand what Israel is really like. And anything that does that helps the Palestinians. Now, in terms of the one state solution, um, I think again, you know, the message took a long time to get through to people that to exclude permanently um, the indigenous population of Palestine, that's the Palestinians and their descendants, to exclude them on the basis of uh, um, an ethnic racist division, you know, that we've got Jews here in the majority, we don't want that majority disturbed, and so therefore, um, you're the wrong ethnicity, you, this is us Palestinians, you're the wrong ethnicity, you're not welcome here, you're not going to be allowed to, to come here. Now, finally, this totally unacceptable way of seeing the world has somehow um, gained and got into people's heads. They've begun to, to understand it. And that is what is making the one-state solution more acceptable. Why? Because for the Palestinians to go home, to return home, people like me who have been barred from living in my own country uh, since 1948, for us to go to go home um, will mean there is no Jewish majority in, what, in Israel. Uh, and that is not what the Zionists, the ideology of Israel was all about. It was about having a majority of Jews um, <clears throat> in this one state, Palestine. Um, now, if that's not going to happen any longer, it's no longer a Zionist state. Now, that's uh, it, it's, it, somehow the, 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 the understanding seems to have reached people that you can't treat um, uh, the population who are natives of this country, you can't keep them out forever. You can't say to them, you have no place here. It's The message has got through. Now, uh, where does that link up with the one state? Of course, you, you cannot but do that in one state. 
It can't be done um, by partitioning Palestine. Palestine is too small. It can't take the numbers of exiles, refugees, um, and their descendants. Do you feel that, or what are the stories you remember uh, from your childhood? And were they the sto stories of, you know, one land, one country of more than one people? Um, so if, if you look back, perhaps, what do you feel are the stories that have shaped you or shaped the way you see the world or understand you know, where you come from or what you belong to? Sure. Look, when, when I was born, when I was, I mean, my, not much of my childhood was spent in Paris. I was eight, actually, when we left. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't that I had spent all that length of time in, in Palestine. However, my consciousness, my awareness was of an Arab country. I mean, there were other groups uh, by that time, by the time I was born, um, the 1940s um, began to see an influx of European Jews, German Jews, for example, fleeing from uh, Germany, from Hitler. Um, but these were very clearly um, strangers. Nobody thought for a moment that they're anything to do with the with, with us, with the indigenous people. Uh, so, it, so my consciousness is very much that of an Arab country. Uh, now we happen to be Muslim. We had Christian neighbors. That's they're all, but we're all Arabs, you know. Mm. So that's really how it was. And the language was Arabic, and um, you might have heard church bells ringing, and you might have heard the, the you'd hear the call to prayer. But that was it. Uh, there were some Jews. There were a minority, um, but they kept to themselves, actually. They were quite uh, uh, quiet, and we, there was no friction between any of us. So that was my the memory I opened my eyes to, you know, the, the, the reality I opened my eyes to. Um, but by the time we left, um, I had experienced, what well, I would say, a couple of years of it's apprehension and some fear. Now, I didn't understand what was going on, but I could see, I could experience, there were things that were happening which were scary. Uh, for example, in our neighborhood, which was in West Jerusalem, which the Zionists wanted from early on, they had set their sights on it. Um, you know, you had armed men uh, around and and uh, there were of course there was a, a local resistance amongst the Palestinians so they were armed too and uh, you know they they would they would clash and um, though I didn't know what the clashes were about that created an atmosphere of anxiety let's say um, and then but then I'd forget about it you see because it, it then happened and life returned as it were to normal until really the beginning of 1948, there was nothing normal about those early months. It, they were really scary. And those constitute my memories because um, there was bombing, there were shootings, there were snipers in, our, in buildings because a lot of the houses around ours had emptied because people were scared and they, and they, and they left. They took their families and they went wherever they could to, you know, to members of their family outside Jerusalem. So the, the houses were empty. The, the Jewish fighters took over the houses and they'd start to, and they'd shoot, they'd shoot into the street. So uh, that was very, um, very alarming, particularly because, you know, our mother wouldn't allow us out. So we didn't have a normal life. Um, now, to tell you that I... I didn't understand why it is true, is a reality. And that's made it so much worse. I didn't know who the people were who were shooting, what was the matter with them, and who might be shot there for, because I had no sense of they were the, the enemy and, you know, we were, they wanted our homes and, they, you know. So that shaped my um, childhood. Um, 
in the two years before we left. <clears throat> Not before, because I, I really was too young and I, I didn't, I was, my life was all right, you know. Um, but then it, from 1946, I would say to 1948, it was getting more and more worrying. Um, and then, of course, there was the departure. There was the day or uh, the day we left. Uh, that's a very sad day in my life. For me, I mean, I know it's probably, it sounds banal, but <clears throat> the way you describe how you look back and see the dock and how you worry about the dock, Rex, um, it's, it's a scene that I, I feel that, you know, almost every reader can, in a way, relate to. And this is something I think, if I understood correctly, also uh, Noam Chomsky, when he read the book In Search of Fatima, he, he felt that this is also a story of his um, life or his search. And I would be interested, perhaps, I mean, how, how do you feel? Why is it important to write these stories? Um, what's the power of books for you? Well, you know, um, <laughs> I wrote it, at, I decided to write it my, very late in my life. I wish I'd written it earlier, but I didn't think to do it um, because, you know, I accepted that's what happened to me, that's what happened to us, and that's all there was to it. However, because I had become a political activist for Palestine, um, I was extremely concerned with the messages getting over to other pe to, to people because I lived in um, a society in Britain where the general uh, uh, opinion was on Israel's side, frankly. And that was really very unpleasant. Um, and I had worked for years to try to see if I could change that and, you know, to find ways in which our story our side of this uh, could be heard by other people, could be seen. Uh, not that we were invisible, you know, the invisible victims or, the, you know, people who didn't really know who, that, who they were and couldn't care less. I didn't want that. So um, I had worked, as I say, I'd been an activist for uh, years, and I noticed <laughs> that things were getting worse for the Palestinians. I honestly... I was just so depressing. I thought, what's wrong? Why are people not getting the message? And then it came to me, as I say, very late in my life, it came to me that they're not getting, that they're, not that they're not getting the message, but that they get the message so much more effectively if it was through a personal story. Mm -hmm. People can identify with a personal story. I mean, you just said now, you see yourself, you said about the day of my departure from Jerusalem and my dog, and the thing that really um, told me that things were very, very serious and very bad was having to leave the dog behind. And, and that is something anybody can, as you say, relate to. They can understand that. A child, after all, this the dog filled my life. And the idea that he would be left behind and I didn't know um, anything. I didn't know if I'd see him again. Now, so what I'm saying is that got through to people. And of course, I realized that if I told the story personally, as what happened to us, really, um, you know, and offer it to people, do they understand? Can they understand? Um, so that's why I wrote the book. And um, I, I'm you know, gratified, I'm grateful that uh, it was picked up, the message was picked up. Uh, mm -hmm. People did read it. Uh, and they wrote to me, so many people wrote to me saying, but that's how I feel. These aren't Palestinians. These were mm -hmm. people who were, you know, Pakistanis, uh, Muslims trying to fit into a, a new society. And as you said, Noam Chomsky, well, on earth, uh, how, how would one imagine there was anything in common? But you see, he had been, he was the child of Orthodox Jewish uh, parents and he didn't fit in. Uh, and so he felt displaced. Uh, he worried about his identity, you know. Uh, and so that was really very interesting that he should have found a sense of identification with the story. So it's true. 
yes, uh, people do respond to a personal story in a way that they won't respond to an account of United Nations resolutions, for example. Mm. <clears throat> and for me, it was also really interesting to read um, one of the um, commemorative talks uh, you held uh, for Edward Said. Um, and you mentioned that he was a greater threat to Israel than any armed Palestinian resistance. Um, and I would be interested if you can explain a little bit about that and what it means. And if you feel that today ideas are still so strong and then perhaps also, you know, how to keep sane because ideas are strong, but it's not always the strength of ideas that seems to rule or turn the world. No, that's right. Well, look, uh, the question of Edward Said, I mean, one thing that uh, Israel really, really doesn't like, it is the presence of articulate, um, intelligent, um, attractive Palestinians talking about Palestine and about what happened. You, you see, so long as uh, we were represented by um, people who whose language was very poor, I mean, whose foreign language was poor, so they could hardly really speak properly. Uh, furthermore, they were not um, Western oriented. They didn't understand Western society. So they would have come, they would come across as rather fierce or very alien, you know, men with beards or men with mustaches and um, who didn't speak properly, etc. Now, for a long time, that's what there was, which was fine for Israel. That's fine. So long as the Palestinians um, appear to be um, even probably aggressive or or um, not not appealing, uh, that's fine. But when you have Palestinians who are not like that, who are articulate, who are arresting, you want to listen to them, you want to hear what they have to say, uh, this is not good news. Now, Edward Said was the prime example of that, a man of great intellectual ability, but with communication skills. So he got, he came across in a very attractive way. He got the message across uh, very well. And um, he was well-educated, highly educated, was present at a big university, Columbia University. It's the kind of thing Israel doesn't like. And so that's really what I meant. It's dangerous for them because it's people like that who can convey the message, the thing I've been talking about since you know, in this interview, um, it's the message they don't want for that to to to, to come across. Anyway, uh, which is, by the way, just as an aside, why I actually think Israel likes Hamas. They like them despite all this hoo ha, because Hamas comes. They can they can make out that Hamas is fierce and uh, terrorist and uh, fanatics and that kind of thing. That's fine. Um, uh, you know, uh, as long as it stays like that, what we don't want is uh, people who are coming across in a different way. Um, now, you did ask me something else, which now I... About how to keep sane um, when you have good ideas, but it's not the good ideas that somehow turn the world. No, look, look, this has been a very, very big problem for me, for all activists. How do you translate uh, ideas which are good ideas, really? How do you translate them into action? How do you implement them? A very, very big problem. And you know, obviously, by the way you asked that question, many people are okay about thinking up ideas. They're quite creative and they'll think of this, think of that, but 
you can think up any number of ideas you like if you can't take it any further it won't make any difference really um, now of course i exclude from that the fact that when you introduce an idea which people aren't used to they have to have a stage in which they become accustomed to it and then they start to think about it and then things may begin to happen a typical example is the one state solution i can remember when i first started talking about this nobody was interested they would say to me ah oh, a stupid idea or you're very utopian yes yes sure sure you know in in some paradise somewhere but not on earth that kind of thing uh, but then you know one went on talking about it and other people picked it up and they started talking about it and so there is a stage in which you do need to discuss an idea it's not a stage of action it's a, a, a practical action on it it's a stage of introducing an idea and then people begin to think and then uh, the next thing is uh, somebody somewhere or so you hope will think ah now maybe if i could start to apply uh, something like this uh, in a particular village or a community or, or etc and and so you know that slowly that kind of thing happens it's very frustrating of course it is especially in the, with the issue of time i am so conscious of time you know i mean ah oh dear I, my sister is 90 and i tell you she is on record as saying she is not prepared to die while the state of israel is around in the way that it is you know um she wants to see a day it's not so much about the state of israel she said i want to see the day that i can go home and i don't want to die before that yeah and this returns us to the right of return right of for palestinian refugees um but i would like to uh because you mentioned also the activism um and at the same time i will invite people uh also if they have any questions to contribute um them and we will try to include them in the conversation but um during your activism you met in london uh with ellen siegel uh a nurse um who has also worked uh in the occupied territories in Palestine and you have uh started a solidarity kind of placard project action um i still cannot return and you took photographs uh in 1973 1992 and 2011 the last one also somehow showing this passage of time that you have mentioned and um hopefully we will also see some of the photographs um uh from these years but i would be interested just to for you perhaps to um explain what does what does this project mean to you and also the symbolism of you know cooperation between ellen and you um do you feel that it has brought also some breakthroughs or a message um that couldn't be done otherwise um yes look the right of return uh is something that i would have imagined everybody would be able to understand that if somebody has been expelled from their homeland they have the right to go back to it now i i i i I I couldn't understand for years that this principle is very simple uh, was understood readily understood by people except in the case of the Palestinians it's amazing you know if if you are um uh, I don't know some other nationality and you lose your home in a war or in some conflict or other uh, you go home you get returned home um you know that happened in the balkans uh, so, so, but why why not the palestinians you know it seemed that somehow that message about our right it's an absolute right it's not relative you know because they're jews or because they're eskimos or whatever you, people have been displaced from their own homeland 
and they have the right to return to it. It's as simple as that. Anyway, I, I realized over years that it somehow wasn't simple in the case of Israel. Everybody sided with Israel, you know. You know, if you all come up, come back, then it's their demographic threat and stuff like this. Um, and then it wasn't actually me. It was nor was it Ellen. It was another activist who had this brilliant idea of summing up the problem. So he got me and Ellen together, and he put a placard. He 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 he. he drew it, he, made, he, he wrote it, and it said, uh, uh, you know, the one I was holding says, I am Palestinian, I was born in Jerusalem, but I cannot return there. Ellen, uh, uh, who's a Jewish New Yorker, she said, I am Jewish, I was born in New York, but I can return to, to you know, return in the commerce to Jerusalem. And we thought, this was so brilliant. It sums up the whole problem, uh, you know. Anyway, and when you pointed out the fact that we repeated the same thing uh, twice, uh, the last one being 2011, it also made a point. It's the same placards, the same message, but it made a point that the years passed and nothing changed. We still were holding those placards. We was, I was still not home, uh, you know. So now. Uh, you asked about um, solidarity and working with, with Jewish activists and so on. Um, yes, I mean, uh, um, all my activist life, I have teamed up with and made friends with Jewish activists who feel the same. Uh, as long as my only condition was no Zionists. Anybody who is a Zionist, there's no way that I could have teamed up with them. Um, uh, and I can explain that if people want to ask a question, but uh, Jewish activists who cared about uh, hu human rights and, and the plight of the Palestinians, yes, and we, we work together, we still work together. Okay. Um, and do you feel that um, this right of return is also something that is the really threatening thing i mean that it's actually the the game change for israel because i will perhaps include uh we got from simon gross it's more of a, co uh, a comment but um he says that for him it's a question if palestine still exists in any meaningful sense of the term today um and he claims that what's happening there is actually that in reality, the state of Israel already has de facto ownership and control of the entire territory. Um, and a two state solution that's now being a long forgotten promise by mm -hmm. Israel. Uh, and with what was previously understood to be Palestinian population of 2 million people basically reduced to an underprivileged class within the modern state of Israel. And what is happening is that now those 2 million people are in a very strange situation where they're expected to abide by the foreign religious laws and the legal system of their former occupier that is their official enemy. Um, so it's, it's a description, I guess, of um, apartheid inside Israel, but there is also apartheid and Israeli control of the uh, occupied territories, West Bank, and the blockade of Gaza, and what we see now also the bombardment um, and destruction that has been going on now in <laughs> kind of repeated periods uh, again and again. Um, so, yeah, perhaps maybe a comment to this, and then also, you know, how how do you see if we see this as one space, as one home? Um, how can this change the ideas of people, given that statehood somehow has been and still is for many people an ideal? Um, can we, I mean, can also literature in a way, you know, some broaden our imagination to think beyond that? Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Yes, the uh, area between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea today is one state. There's, it's a fact. Uh, Israel rules all this area. Um, <clears throat> indeed, it is one state. I mean, 
to talk about the occupied territory is no longer uh, accurate because, the, the, if you like, the whole area is occupied by Israel or uh, none of it is, you know. I mean, it's, it, it's not divisible anymore and it is actually one state with one sovereign ruler that is, that is Israel. Now, um, uh, the, 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 how, what does one do with that? Well, you see, uh, in my later my latest writings, uh, um, this is what I've been proposing. Uh, there is only one thing you can do with that. Uh, you must start a huge campaign uh, on the Palestinian side and everybody, anybody who cares about Palestinians, a huge campaign for equal rights. It seems to me to be absolutely obvious that uh, you've got this one area, which used to be historic Palestine, then became partly Israel and partly the Palestinian areas or territories or whatever, is, is one territory, is actually one territory, and it's one state. And the, 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 the task before us is to convert this apartheid state, which, as you point out, with a lot of discrimination against those who hold Israeli citizenship and the ones who have nothing, no citizenship, no rights, that's the Palestinians Israel rules in the so-called occupied territories. Um, all these people have the right to demand equality uh, in the state. And this is what they need to do. But do you feel, I mean, you know, given your experience also in the refugee camps, um, how how much pain or destruction um, do you fear must that um, bring about as well? Because I guess it's it's a scary um, possibility that probably also many people um, living in Palestine today face or have to deal with, you know, the question of, okay, what does this mean? So there's this idea of dismantling the Palestinian authority. And I remember some Palestinians saying, yes, but it's still better than, you know, dealing with the Palestinian authority than dealing with the um, Israeli army. And although that probably can be debatable, but I remember also you writing that, you know, you feel that your rights now somehow are in the hands of uh, the Palestinians living in the occupied territories and their decisions and their fight and you know what they're ready to um, fight for or where they're ready to make some concessions. Um, so, yeah, perhaps you know how do you see um, these possibilities somehow? manifesting into reality that would not mean too many deaths, too much suffering. Um, because equal rights sounds very nice, but given the power relations on the ground, it seems it's a very far um, possibility and dream. Yeah, sure. And you did ask me actually about statehood and your right that many Palestinians uh, still cherish the idea of having their own state. That still remains a, a, a very real uh, dream, aim, whatever one would call it. Um, yes, this is very difficult and that is in the way of what I'm talking about. Um, but you see, you see, there comes a point when you have to what we call in English, cut your losses. You have, to, you have to come to a point where you cannot have uh, things that you might want because the situation just simply won't allow it. So the idea of, uh, for, for a start, statehood, statehood is not attainable. It's not attainable. It's really very clear. Uh, we know that the two-state solution is is not uh, going to happen. We know that Israel is not going to allow it to happen, and therefore it won't happen. Okay, so it's a very sad thing, but there we are. That's how it is. Now, in terms of, um, you say, um, equal rights sounds very nice, but 
you've got this superior force. Yes, indeed, that's the problem. You have a superior force. You have this great power, uh, which is the Israeli state. Um, so what are you going to do? Are you going to just, you know, go on hoping and dreaming and um, uh, the, the, the issue about the Palestinian Authority? I fully understand why. Because apart from anything else, the Palestinian Authority is the administrative body which gives people their salaries. So they can't, in, you know, in a very real sense, they can't give up uh, a way of um, supporting their families. That I understand. But the, the broader point is that what are your real options? There's nothing ideal here. So if you look at your real options, one option would be, well, it's not an option, you stay as you are and you take all the blows, all the misery, all the stuff. Uh, or the other option is you try and do something. So the, what is the something? There is only one thing you can do. You can't move Israel out. You can't fight it in terms of, in militarily, I mean, you can't fight it. Uh, but what you can do is say, right, you're ruling us, but we have no rights. You're not giving us any rights. We need our rights. And this would be the start. Um, but you know what is fascinating about what's happening now? In a way, if this continues in the way it has been in the last few days, if you think about it, it's really had uh, the, the, an effect you never would have imagined if you'd sat, sat down and planned it. That, that I have no doubt the Israeli... Uh, authorities are in retreat. They don't know what to do. Uh, it, you know, it's uh, it's very alarming for them. But of, leaving aside the, the the price being paid by Palestinians and deaths, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but actually for Israel, this is very very alarming. They don't know what to do because they've got various things happening which they hate, which they never ever wanted. Firstly that uh, the Palestinians are demonstrating and up in arms inside 48 Israel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing for the people to carry on in the occupied territories, but it's another within the state itself. So that's happening in a, in a very, very big and dramatic way. Secondly, the thing they don't like and they don't know what to do with is their own people being killed. This is immensely worrying for them. And so far, six, as I heard earlier, Six Israelis have died. Now, it's not, no, it's not when you say six as opposed to over 40 on the Palestinian side, it sounds very, very few. But for Israel, I'm saying, for, for Israelis, it's horrendous. They're terrified of things like this. And, you know, uh, 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 thirdly, they, 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 can't, they can't deal with so many, so much unrest everywhere. Everything is up in arms, everybody. The ones in 48, the people in the West Bank, the people in Gaza, the people in Jerusalem, they don't know what to do. So, you know, it's, it, we have to suspend judgment in a way to see what comes out of this. Um, but my suggestion, as I said, is really that the way forward, because I believe it to be the only option, quite seriously, is the demand for equal rights. And in that, I have my model in South Africa. I really do. I know it's different. But on the other hand, there you had the African state, very strong, very much in control, with a nasty police, with a horrible army, you know, and yet blacks uh, dis without franchise, without any rights, uh, got together. They got together and they made it happen. And I think we have to, we, Palestinians have to try to do the same. And by the way, at the same time, we mustn't ignore the, the help of people outside the Palestine, uh, outside Palestine, people who have a moral sense, people who don't like to see this sort of injustice and help us and would help us, I think, in the struggle. Do you feel, because we've seen, I mean, especially in Gaza, there was the march of return, right? Uh, exactly, you know, basing the uh, actions and the protests on the idea, or not on the idea, but on the right of return. 
And if I if I'm not mistaken, I think in the time when there were protests in the region called the Arab Spring, there was also at one point an attempt or this idea that Palestinian refugees from different parts, you know, would just try to go, forget about the borders, cross, go back to their homes. Yet these, these things were um, stopped in case of Gaza marches with, you know, many and huge, many fatal, fatalities, many deaths, um, and with a huge price uh, for the people there protesting. So my question would be, I mean, do you see that have we learned something and perhaps this we is a bit um, presumptuous or you know have people um, or yeah have we as society um, aiming for justice and equality uh, have we learned something or is this time different why do you think is this time different um well first of all the 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 response of israel to to any of this, uh, which is normally brutal, normally to do with military action, that's what they do. Um, you know, they're, you're dealing with killers, you know, one has to be very careful. Um, my, therefore, my suggest that's why uh, what I'm advocating is a campaign uh, which is making a demand, which in particular the West would understand. You see the, the poor people of Gaza talking about return and the people who tried to walk across. As I explained earlier, for reasons that beyond me to understand, nobody can see this. They don't, they don't understand this idea that these people <laughs> have been expelled from their homes and they would like to go home. There's too much disinformation. Uh, people have been conditioned not to understand how the Palestinian refugees came into being, where they came from. They don't know any of that. And so the way it's viewed is you've got this horde of people who are making a lot of fuss about going home and being very threatening towards the Israelis. So that's no good. That's not a starter. And the, the suggestion I'm making is that a demand for equal rights has precedence. It's a recognized principle. It's something everybody in the United States understands from the civil rights movement, uh, mm -hmm. from South Africa in elsewhere in the West, the anti-apartheid movement, the, um, the African National Congress demand for one person, one vote. This is familiar. And so when you have Palestinians who say we are being ruled, the facts are very simple. We have this ruler and that is Israel, and we have no rights whatsoever. And we're asking for our rights. We're not threatening anybody. We're not shooting at anybody. We're asking for our rights. It's something that is worth exploring, really. I can't put it more, uh, more forcefully than that because we don't know. But that's something that people should think about, in my opinion. Okay. And we have here now a question from um, Nada. Um, she she's asking, speaking of return, do you think Salman Abu Sita's project of return is feasible? Yeah, Salman Abu Sita has done us all a big favor. He has worked out uh, how it can be done. That's what his great contribution has been. You know, he he has shown for uh, because one of the arguments against return that the Israelis use all the time is that there's no space, uh, they can't accommodate all these you know, millions of people. Um, uh, Salman Abu Sita has shown that that's not accurate. That if you look at the pattern of residence in um, Israel, you'll find that most of the population is in the cities and a very small number are in the rural areas. And he's worked out mathematically and very interestingly that the Palestinians would return to, not to their actual homes, that's very difficult, but to the, all these areas which are under inhabited by Israelis. So he has done that and it's great because it's a map of how it can be done. But it's about how. It, the problem is, how do you get it to happen? 
as, as ever. You know, very good idea. How do you get it to happen? And perhaps to there's another question from people um, look looking or uh, yeah, um, listening. Um, a question of how many Israeli Jews really sympathize uh, with Palestinian percentage wise, or is any political party in Israel supporting Palestinian rights? It appears that Israeli human rights supporters have no political voice. Perhaps also just about you know the political support for the idea of one state solution. Do you see that this is when it comes to political parties or political organizations, is it changing? Well, it's certainly um, the fact that there are individual uh, Jewish Israelis who are working towards the uh, one state idea, who are sympathetic. And um, there is, in fact, currently uh, an organization which is called um, One Democratic State Campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, by Jeff Halper as well. That's right. Uh, and that sort of seems to be making some headway. So there are there, there are some. It's not that the, but there are a, a small number. That's the problem. There are a very small number. There is no political party now which espouses this idea. There used to be the Arab political party called Al Balad, which um does have in its official program the one state. Um, but you see, that's the problem with the whole one state idea. Um, no official body has adopted it anywhere. There's no party that adopted it. There's no institution that has adopted it, no state, no government. So it's really quite difficult. And it's one of the roots for me into my um, equal rights idea. Because if you're going to hang around waiting for s some institution, some government something some formal uh, recognition of the one state you're going to be waiting for a very long time uh, whereas if you're asking for equal rights you're not asking for one state you're asking for equal rights um that's yeah that that applies to the people who are living there who are asking for their rights mm -hmm. and on the whole of the territory that's being controlled right Yes, yes, um, absolutely. And and I see that as the first step. Of, I don't see that that's, if, if they get their equal rights and that's it, everybody's happy. No, of course it's going to be a first step. And the Israelis know that as well as I do, <laughs> you know, which is why they will fight this. They will resist it. But I guess one of the things, and I, if I understand correctly, you have also been involved with uh, the... Um, academic boycott or in Britain um, when it comes to um, trying to make Israel abide by the international law and an important part of uh, activities it seems now on the solidarity um, stage is also the BDS movement. So I'm wondering, I mean, how do you see, how has this changed? We've heard for, you know, there are Again and again, there is an example of a boycott here or, um, you know, an Israeli uh, or a Palestinian um, event being cancelled because of the pressures by the Israeli ambassador or something similar. In Germany, we have also seen um, certain, you know, steps trying to criminalize or at least... Um, make it very difficult for people to um, argue for BDS, equating the um, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. And it's the same fight that we see is being internationally fought um, also by the solidarity activists in America. So how do you feel is the BDS part of this campaign and what has for you uh, this British academic boycott presented or what has it meant and what has it brought? Yeah, look, um, the, the, all these activities, BDS, the academic boycott, these um, initiatives are necessary. They have to keep going. They have to. They're very important. Um, because really, um, if, if you, um, 
it, one of the things that should encourage people who support the boycott and people involved in the boycott movement is the way Israel has responded. And you, you've mentioned now that um, the, the amount of censorship and the, 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 the Palestine, pro-Palestinian uh, people are facing, that if you set up um, an event to, to promote a Palestinian, um, so to promote Palestinian solidarity, you're shut down, or you're, it is a measure, actually, of how nervous Israel is. And it's a measure of how successful these boycott movements are in getting Israel's to be extremely apprehensive about them. For me, the Israeli lobby or the Israeli ambassador interfering and saying, you know, you can't have this event or you've got to shut this down or whatever, is, is just evidence of how alarmed and nervous they are and therefore of how successful the boycott movement is. So, and one has to understand it in that way and just carry on. Yes, you have to carry on working at it. Okay. You know, by the way, let me just make clear. Look, when I talk about equal rights and things like that, that doesn't in any way imply uh, uh, that all the other initiatives and all the other activities should stop. Absolutely not. They must go on and on, uh, you know, pressing Israel from different ways, uh, from different directions. Mm. It seems that it's, it's a never-ending story uh, and something that it's quite difficult, um, I think, well, for a human to somehow see as, you know, not really reaching the aim, but aiming for the process and horizon and coming closer to the desirable, I guess, outcomes. Um, but I think this is also something that literature offers, this space of... Um, by finding joy and moments and also getting also then some historic perspective of what's happening. Yeah, sure. Yes. Do you feel that for me it's interesting um, because we've hosted uh, previously Raja Shehade and you know, he has been a lawyer. Um, then he fought as activist and as a founder of Al Haq for human rights. Mm -hmm. And now he's, he, in the end, somehow came to the books. And for you, it seems, you know, you have been successful uh, in the medical field as a professor. And also, you know, you have decided you have turned to books. Um, do you see that there are more stories like this um, connected to Palestine? Or is it something more universal that you feel... Um, is being addressed by this somehow transitions? Um, well, I mean, obviously the, 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 um, the basic, you know, the basis of uh, one's writing is Palestine. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt, but um, there are universal lessons, like with every, you know, the Palestine story is, is an epic story because it's about really, uh, it's about archetypes. It's about justice, injustice. Um, it, it's about uh, uh, people who have been um, treated uh, badly. Uh, it's about uh, reclaiming one's sense one's moral sense, one's sense of outrage. You don't have to be Palestinian. You can see that one party is injuring another party unfairly, unjustly, uh, and that should outrage you. It should make your moral sense feel this is wrong and I have to do what I can to reverse it. Uh, so it, in that sense, Palestine has universal appeal. But if you ask, say, about me or Reza or any of the other people who are writing, of us who are writing about uh, Palestine, it is very personal. Yes, it's about Palestine. That's really what it's about. And um, do you feel that when it comes to um, something that's very universal now, is also the experience of um, the pandemic. 
And if I somehow return or turn also to your um, career and your work in medicine, this is also something universal. And we, we've seen now that Israel can somehow weaponize even this. There, you know, apartheid can, can be also on the level of um, the right to medical care or um, to get vaccines. Um, I'm wondering, as a medical you know, professionalist, as someone who worked in hospitals, who understands health in a very broad way, if I understand correctly, um, what do you feel are we missing? Should also our you know, thinking about health or well-being be in a way decolonized? Well, I think that's certainly true about Israel. I mean, that certainly needs to decolonize itself, that's for sure. Um, and I suppose to a certain extent, uh, those populations whose governments until recently were colonial governments uh, do have um, a colonial sense to, in, in health, yes. That, that uh, uh, you know, in, in Britain at the moment, we have an, an issue about the vaccine should um, vaccine, which is being manufactured in order to give a booster dose to the population in the autumn, should that be allowed or should these vaccines be taken to the poorer countries that have d don't even have one injection? Uh, they don't even have the first dose of the vaccine, you know, and you can see it in people's attitudes. You, why, why should these foreigners or or people who are black or brown or whatever, you know, why should they have this? What about keeping it for us? You know, there are there, there are these things, but it's true. But you see, the point about Israel, I can't. I find it very difficult to fit Israel into any kind of tradition. I mean, of course, it's a settler colony. Of course, it's a colonial um, type um, entity. But in many senses, you know, it's unique. So it's quite, you know, um, it's it's quite difficult to uh, to try and make generalizations, you know, which include Israel. I mean, this whole behavior towards vaccinating. Uh, their own people and uh, leaving out and, and at the cost and not vaccinating the Palestinians um, is is uniquely nasty. I mean, I, I can imagine that there are other colonial regimes uh, which might be tempted to do that, but they often those colonial were often quite paternalistic. So they, uh, as part of their colonialism, of course, so they, they did provide some kind of welfare for the natives. Um, but the, this, uh, you know, Israel is um, it's very strange. Um, I'll jump a bit uh, back uh, also to your, you know, personal narratives and what you um, share, what you write, because your writing is autobiographical mostly. And you, and you know, personal is political, it's quite clear, and especially um, when it comes to Palestine. Do you ever though fear or do you have any second thoughts or worries what to include or what to share? You know, when you write, when you look back, how what were the thoughts or what did you worry about, care about when um, the book went to somehow the printing presses or before that? Um, so in, in the process of editing, um, how, how much personal is too personal or is there no such thing as too personal? No, there is, there is. I mean, look, where return was concerned, I was quite worried about members of the Palestinian Authority reading it mm -hmm. because it wasn't very complimentary to them. And I was very uh, candid about their failings. So I don't think they would have been very happy 
Um, but you see, I was very candid about myself. And I, I think there was quite a lot of self-exposure in that book, um, which looking back, I regret. Uh, you know, I, I wish I had not been quite so um, frank <clears throat> about my own life and fears and what happened, etc. Yes, so it's so yes, one does have to think. I mean, for example, um, I've, I've changed the names often of, of a lot of the people in that because of this consideration. You don't want people to um, to get hurt and upset, um, and it gives you a freedom when you change the name. You you know, it's almost as if it's an invented character. But I think that's probably in common with everybody else who writes uh, autobiographically and is not writing clearly a novel. Mm. But do you did you get any negative responses regarding the return and everything you you know have described and you know how you describe the disappointment and all the experience you had to go through and disillusionment in many ways? No, I didn't, but I don't take that. Uh, I think that indicates that I'm afraid a lot of the people who would have been offended don't read. So and I'm serious. I don't think they read it. So therefore, they didn't know anything about it, which, you know, may be just as well. <clears throat> okay. Well, what what are you currently reading? I mean, are there voices from Palestine that you feel you know, should be more read uh, or better heard? Um, well, you know, um, there is quite a lot of writing in Arabic. Um, and I, I really wish that more of these were translated. Um, it, it's no particular writer, but there's quite a few of them. And some are writing memoirs, some are writing novels, uh, but uh, they're all influenced by the situation they're in. So the, these are insights into life uh, under Israeli rule of one sort or another, um, and they're valuable. So um, I, I wish indeed they would be translated, as I wish for my own books to be translated into Arabic, which they haven't been, none of them. So the other way, you know. Have you, um, okay, that is quite surprising, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I've never really understood it. They've said all sorts of, <clears throat> I've ha I had a lot of excuses, stories. I didn't believe any of them. You know, for example, some publishers said it was too big in search of Fatima, this is, was too long mm -hmm. and uh, it would cost them a lot to translate and stuff like this. So I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But you are uh, continuing with writing, right? Well, yes, I think so, you know, because what I think you, you, perhaps I can, I can talk about is that um, after I finished um, well, I'd, I'd, I'd finished, uh, my, my book Return was published in 2015. Anyway, um, I then wrote a novel, but something very unusual for me, not about Palestine. It was not about Palestine. I wrote a historical novel, which was set in medieval Baghdad. And, uh, and you know, it was, um, uh, it's a sort of detective story uh, as well as a love story and uh, I really enjoyed writing it uh, <laughs> however um, so so that so that I did but sadly it found no publisher it, you know what, what, I am not known for writing about anything other than Palestine and I had a feeling that people thought well this is not her metier so, you know, maybe, I don't know. I, I, obviously, they won't tell you the truth, but it has not, <laughs> it has not succeeded, I'm sad to say. Hmm. Do you feel that it's um, like this, you know, um, 
these hier hierarchies or uh, spaces that you try to get into. Um, in your experiences, I mean, is a literary or cultural um, space, is it more democratic than some other spaces? Uh, what have your, what has your experience been? I mean, also given this experience that, you know, you, you haven't found a publisher, how um, somehow, how elitist are these circles? Um, and, you know, if, even if you compare them to, I don't know, some other um, spaces you have ventured into? Um, well, I mean, certainly if you're writing novels, um, they, they, they will be much more democratic because you're, you're, um, you're not, uh, um, you're not aligning yourself with any particular uh, group. Uh, for example, when you write, one man writes academically or politically, you have in your mind a particular set, um, a type of um, researcher or scholar. Uh, that, that doesn't happen with novels. So they really are, yes, you're right, they're much more democratic. And you know, when I was writing this Baghdad novel, well, it really annoyed me. I, um, <clears throat> it really was a story. And I thought that's lovely, it's nice, people like stories. And it's a story, really. And it had echoes of the Arabian Nights, um, which I thought, you know, would have made it more appealing. Well, uh, I'm afraid I was quite wrong. So, <laughs> so there we are. Okay, but your writing continues also when it comes to um, marriage to another man and the idea of one state solution. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's the latest thing, indeed. Uh, but that will go into the French language, so it's not available in English. Um, yeah, but that's what's happening now. Okay. But do you feel that perhaps uh, making it available also in English is something that would currently be the step in the right direction also, you know, given the conversation uh, we've had? Yeah, I do actually, because I, I know that Pluto, the original publishers, mm -hmm. uh, they, they have expressed an interest in, in publishing the English, uh, you know, the English version. And so indeed, yes, that's something that might happen. Um, it, yeah, you, you're very... Um, <laughs> yeah, I wish you could be my agent. Well, I mean, basically, it would be just nice to, you know, have something also uh, more accessible to us here, whether um, in Slovenian or at least in English. But yeah, perhaps perhaps it comes from French to Slovenian as well, because mm. I think that the return Vernito in uh, Slovenian uh, proves that um, we need more stories like this and your writing for sure um, is I think um, one of the more important ones to somehow convey the story of Palestine and everything that has meant um, in the last 70 plus or even more years. So um, it's been a huge honor to have you uh, tonight with us. And um, I do hope that when the situation allows, we meet uh, perhaps also uh, live in Ljubljana, uh, perhaps with the publication of your uh, next book uh, and its translation into Slovenian. Um, and uh, I think also what you have said that stories must be told and that it's worth uh, somehow, you know, taking the space to tell them and taking the right to tell them. Um, that for sure is more true today than it seems at any time. So I would like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gada Karmi, for um, your time and kindness uh, to be with us today. Thank you for your work um, and your thoughts. And um, I hope stories continue. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And indeed, I also hope we might meet at some future date. Yes. Thank you. Okay. As I... they say, inshallah, right? <laughs> inshallah. <laughs>
<laughs> so good night to London um, and good night, Cora. everyone. Good night. Okay. Um, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. In hvala sam tudi iz Ljubljane za pozornost in se vidimo prihodnič.